This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We do more varieties and flavors of cheese than anywhere else on earth. By pushing the boundaries of what cheese can and should be, find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Welcome to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer, and it is Friday, May 10th, 2024. And this is our 386th episode of this series, which is dedicated to behind-the-scenes talent in the hospitality industry. Today, my guest is a fabulous fellow podcaster and hospitality entrepreneur who is based on the West Coast, and I will introduce him fully in a moment. First, as I do in every show, I will start out with my PR tip, and then later we'll have my speed round game, industry news discussion, solo dining experience, and the final question. As the founder of Bayer Public Relations, I'm going to tip the show off with my PR tip of the week. So today's tip is to strive to make a positive impact on the world. Yes, let's aim to do good, to make change for the better, to advance our society and communities and grow and prosper. Let's forget negativity and naysayers and surround ourselves with people who believe in us and us in them. By living day by day with an optimistic outlook and good energy, we can make a difference and help lead the next generation to a brighter future. That's my tip today. Okay, so I'm so excited to be here today with my guest, who is Gabriel Arnelas, a strategist, producer, and founder of Studio Arnelas a global multidisciplinary group of business builders who are deeply invested in the worlds of food, hospitality, travel, and culture. An entrepreneur himself, Gabriel has spent his career developing and producing compelling branded experiences through content, media, and partnerships. He is also the creator, host, and producer of On The Pass podcast, serving up inspiring conversations with figures in food, beverage, and hospitality, now celebrating its fourth anniversary. Without further ado, Gabriel, hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, Sherry. Thanks so much for having me. This is awesome. This is awesome. (laughs) I love chatting with someone on the other side of the country. And your world map behind you too makes me want to <laughs> want to travel with all, more. With so. all my pins in it of, of the places I've been in the world. Oh, I can't <laughs> see the pins from here, but that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it's so great to, to be chatting with you today and that we connected recently in New York as well and got to meet for the first time. So I found out a little about your background when we met, but I want to share with my listeners more about you. So can you take us back to your childhood? You grew up West Coast or you moved? Yeah, East, East Coast and East Coast and West West Coast. Um, okay. We were we were pretty bi-coastal, but um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I feel, I've said this a few times to, to people, um, I feel very fortunate to have grown up in a family that really values like deep connection and community and in so much of my work now and the work that both of us really do um, is really about community building and really about, you know, store storytelling. And, you know, people talk a lot about storytelling, but I, I was so fortunate at an early age to see my parents, you know, as, as we were the only people in our family moved from New York to the West coast to have to develop our own community. And I saw how my parents invested in people. I saw how they connected with people and and really how they built community around their friends, which, you know, as as sort of a transplant, it's not easy to do. And also coming to from one coast to the other, culturally, it's different. Um, we, We engaged with a lot of different people. And so I just, I saw my parents create this community through dinners and extending themselves. And it was a muscle that, that I saw them work 
that I started working because I learned how to, how do you set the table properly? How do you welcome someone as they come into, come into the household? And these are all things, Sherry, that play into all the things that I do right now with my work, how I service my clients, and ultimately how um, I create memorable, memorable experiences. And so my father was a peace officer. My mother worked in a hospital. And so it's so funny that every element of their day was dedicated towards, towards serving others. And yet, somehow, they had the energy when they came back home to also continue that service by bringing friends over. We were always the home that people wanted to open up that bottle of wine with or you know or try my mother's my mother's cooking my mom comes from an italian family um you know from southern italy and so my mom learned from her grandmother and her and her mother you know how to translate in, in an american way um some of those you know kind of family dishes and she just cooked with so much love and so much passion and um I took it for granted, honestly, for 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 a long time. But now I I see because it plays into everything that I'm doing. So much of that love, so much of that passion, so much of that intention um, into all the work that I, that I do, and I think that is translated in the show that I have as well. And I just want to take a moment and congratulate you on all the hard work that you've done with this show, because as a host and as a producer, I know how difficult this is. And, and most people don't see the challenge and and the organization and the time that we put into it. So I want to congratulate you on, on this show and all the years that you've been doing it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. It means a lot. Um, yeah, I've always, I started my show as a passion project and I just keep going with it 10 years in. I mean, it's crazy, but I put a lot into it and you you know, it's not maybe as easy as we make it look. <laughs> no, it's definitely, not. Um, it's definitely not. But thank you for saying that. And um, congratulations on your show. I mean, four years is a lot of time to be to be on the air and interviewing people and um, a, a big milestone. So um, we, we got to celebrate the small win, Sherry. You know, we got to it's a, it's a small milestone, but we ha- we need to celebrate the small wins. It is in not, life. But it's but it's not. I mean, Four years is a long time, and yeah. we'll get it. We'll get into all the episodes you've done and and or highlights of that. But going back, so it's funny when I look back in my career, and I'm sort of all the jobs I had in my twenties or working in restaurants, and like mm. at the time, I had no idea that this is what I'd be doing today. That I'd have a PR company or have a podcast and talk to people in the industry. But all that experience helps me today and what I do. And it's so valuable. So when you're talking about your upbringing and your parents and all that experience makes sense now to everything you do and applying it. But how did you break into career wise into hospitality? Was it a job right after college? Were you working in college? Like what was, what was your starting point with the career? Yeah, I think the exact word is break in because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of forced my way uh, into it. But, you know, having that foundation, which I just talked about, which again, at, a, at an early age, it just was like a muscle that I, I, I flexed, but didn't really know that it would have any value for me moving forward. I, I hadn't, I had a great uncle, my grandfather, my, my dad's family is Mexican, um, and so, you know, the family came from Guanajuato, um, moved into Texas and East Coast, and then settled in settled in New York. But I had a great uncle who uh, never had never had children, uh, but him and his wife traveled the world, and I'm and I and like traveled the world in the late seventies, the eighties, the night, like going to Russia, going to Japan, going to. I would get these postcards. And I only went back and forth to New York and we went to Mexico. So like, and again, that's, that I'm, I'm, I'm happy and, I, and I'm grateful that we did that, but I would get insights from him and all these travels and say, I want to do that. Like, how do I do that? And my parents didn't have the money at the time to, to be able to do that. And so I kind of lived vicariously through him and his stories, as well as like many of us do these incredible shows that started really popping up, at, you know, when I was 
when I was in my teens and in my early 20s. Um, and so that was really, I had this foundation of food and love of food with the cooking of my mother. And then this deep passion for travel and exploration and also being sort of like a, a dual culture kid where it's like, you've got influences from the Italian side, you've got influences from the Mexican side, and then you have the influence from being American as well. I had this deep passion for learning about other cultures as well, because I was learning about my cultures also, right. because I didn't grow up in a traditional Italian household or anything like that, or a traditional Mexican, but I had the influences. And so um, that through line really got me started with a few clients like uh, Thompson Hotels and the Pomerantz family or SBE with Sam Nazarian. And I literally just kind of like showed up and said, I had met with a number of executives. I had met Sam. I said, hey guys, I think I could really help you and I think I could really support you. And I'm in my early 20s. And I actually didn't know how I was going to help them or support them, but I knew I was deeply passionate about this space. And I also saw the movement of, of what sort of the forefathers of, uh, you know, individuals like Andre Balazs and, 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 uh, and other people kind of created and how people like Jason Pomerantz, people like uh, 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 Amar Lovani, people like Sam Nazarian were sort of taking boutique hospitality, you know, kind of to that, to that next space in yeah. 2012, 13, 14. And so I started working with a couple of these brands and with SBE and specifically, I think I worked for four months for free. I just kind of kept showing up. And then to the point where they were like, hey, listen, um, you've made some amazing introductions. You have a good head on your shoulder. Uh, we're going to print some business cards. Let's negotiate a deal. And they paid me as a consultant. It was a monthly fee in additions with a contingent compensation. And I was doing kind of restaurant marketing and partnerships, which initially started with like, beverage programs, because that's where most of their partnerships were, were happening and working with key brands and accounts like Bacardi and Pernod and Diageo and Moet Hennessy, and then some smaller, some smaller producers. Um, but then I said, Hey, Hey guys, I think there's, I think there's sort of an undiscoverable amount of, of money, but key partnerships that could be cultural partnerships that have an added layer of storytelling, but also bring in new, new customer acquisition with the Amexes and the Citibanks and the Samsungs and, and, and brands like that. And so I sort of started, in a way, their non-beverage partnerships um, with a lot of these, these kind of key partnerships, looking into the automotive space as well. Um, and these were partnerships that I think, like I said, not only brought in interesting new undiscoverable revenue for for the brands but also it's new client acquisition completely it's like when you do something when we launched a partnership with Amex or Citibank City's paying money but we're creating unique experiences for card members so like I I really kind of got into that space and was like oh I think there's there's so many more interesting ways to engage with financial services because they need to create experiences. They need to create unique access. They need to all compete with each other. And a lot of that is through the culinary space. So we tapped into, you know, Think Food Group at the time and Jose Andreas and, and tapped into a lot of other um, of sort of the culinary partners who were partner in partnership with us at the time and created these unique uh, experiences. And that just layered on to having Fianna Group and, and working with Alan Fianna and the team and Ian Nicholson at the time of launching the Fianna Hotel in South Beach, Miami and putting together unique and interesting partnerships with them. And it just all kind of like, you know, the domino effect from there. It's amazing. And you certainly have good taste. Yeah, all these places are of such style and are such such like amazing brands. You talk, I remember when Faina opened and just seeing the property and all of these spaces, SBE, and they're stylish, but yeah, they're like, they have, they have a point of view and they're places you, you want to go to 
because I feel it's between the hospitality, the brand, the style, the service, the food, all of that. So you you tapping into that and and being a part of it and also so key and the, the idea with partnerships and like listening to you talk about that pretty early on, I'd say, and even that idea of, of partnerships and figuring out experiences in the food and beverage space, because it's more common now. It's um, it's much more common now. And, and granted, you know, there's there were people doing this, um, but I, I just... Yeah, it was a moment in time where you kind of there was this lift in boutique hospitality space and, you know, culinary continuing to really drive the conversation in a lot of ways. And now it's complete table stakes, Sherry. Like you look at you look at big companies like Four Seasons touting how many Michelin stars they have, like like look at the power of how culinary is driving tourism all around the world. But I was fortunate enough to work. Yes, like you said, with some great brands that had a perspective, that had a sense of place, that really had deep intention and understanding of who they are and also the clientele that they wanted they wanted to bring in. And also they had key partnerships with amazing designers, um, you know, really creating cinematic experiences. And I think I, I just did an episode recently with the guys from Ash, um, Ari and, and Xavier. And I think them from a boutique hospitality perspective now are really doing these incredible cinematic experiences and sort of pushing the envelope a little bit in the colors and the boldness of some of these spaces in the design, in the architecture. And I think what they their properties lend themselves to, because we talked about underdog cities, like they're doing stuff in Detroit in in New Orleans, in Providence, Rhode Island, with the hope of doing stuff in bigger cities, but they're basically bringing what we all are accustomed to in the bigger cities and creating a space that we all want to go to in sort of these secondary or tertiary markets, but doing it with with a pizzazz and doing it, you know, challenging uh, you know, kind of a space with bold colors and purple and pink sometimes, but in such a tasteful, tasteful way. So I was very fortunate to work with brands that I think in all, in, in all of their own ways, no matter how any listener feels about the brand now, we're innovative. We're doing things, but learned from the icons of, you know, of, of who kind of, who kind of created the boutique hotel space and learned how to tell stories in in that way. So I was very fortunate to to learn from all of these different collaborators. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And they're all places I want to visit, all places I would like to stay because they do, they have their point of view. And when I choose hotels when I'm traveling, it's you know, a lot of it's based on location or price point, all that. But I love staying at a stylish, like hotel, boutique hotel that has a point of view. It's it's part of the experience of travel. And 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 I think it's it's important for me as as something I look for. And I think all the brands you've worked with have this and they keep developing. And it's, I'm curious to see how it keeps growing, as you said, in other markets and maybe being more innovative or daring or whatever is to come. But I, I think I think talking about cinematic experiences is an interesting story in the sense that both of my clients, both SBE and Fianna that I had at the time, you know, SBE, I believe, had an exclusive with Philippe Stark and in the United States. And Fianna, Alan Fianna in Puerto Madero in Argentina and Buenos Aires was the first person to bring Philippe Stark down to 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 Latin into Latin America into South America, and so, but I think Alan couldn't work with Philippe at that time because you had the Delano, which was designed by Philippe. You had the SLS right next door, which was designed by by Philippe Stark. And so, what was interesting was Alan tapped into Baz Luhrmann and his wife Catherine Martin, um, you know, f- iconic. Australian film director who's won four BAFTAs and four Oscars for set design and costume design. And it was around this time that Great Gatsby had come out. And so if you think about Alan in his all white, in the top hat, in sort of this mythology of his character, 
he's kind of the Latin Gatsby in a way. So, so it made so much sense that, you know, Alan had tapped Baz Luhrmann, who at the time had just come out with Great Gatsby, to design the Fianna Saxony. So, it was, so you know, and again, tapping a film director yeah. to, to do, and, and set designer to do a hotel space. And, and now, you know, there, we're seeing more of this happening, like Pharrell Williams, you know, kind of co-designing a hotel or Lenny Kravitz, obviously, with Kravitz design. But I think that's really interesting and obviously lends itself into that deeper storytelling and mythology of a space. Yeah, 100%. And I realized I'm from Miami originally, so people maybe not as familiar we're referencing Miami South Beach mm-hmm. with Faena property and, and things happening there. The changes I've seen, I mean, as someone growing up in Miami and where Miami Beach was not what it is today. Mm-hmm. I mean, the hotels, when they expanded up to like Lincoln Road, that was one thing. But now these hotels, like what's Faena is like 38th Street or something? 32nd. Or 40- 32nd. Yeah, listen, like, like going up to the Fountain Blue, that whole area just developed so much. Yeah. Um, so it used to sort of be a taxi, just like you'd go from one point to the other. Yeah, and now yeah. there's so much just rich offerings in that in that area. It's, and and from down where Joe Stone Crab is at um, mm-hmm. the South mm-hmm. Point Park, all the way up, because below Fifth also was a little, I guess, sleepy for a time and it's not anymore. It just goes all the way up. So um a lot to see and experience in Miami. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, you had mentioned, and I thought, oh, this is a good segue. You you dropped the word Michelin. And <laughs> I have a question from you from my last guest who sure. has a, received a lot of Michelin stars. So <laughs> let me ask you my question. So sure. on episode 385, I had on the legendary chef Alain Ducasse. And he wow. is the first. Yeah, he was here in New York. Um, and we did the interview in person at Benoit, which is uh, his Incredible. restaurant bistro in Midtown Manhattan. And he has a new book out called Good Taste, A Life of Food and Passion. And the fun fact or a huge fact with him is he was the first chef to have three restaurants awarded with three Michelin stars at the same time. And he's one of just two chefs in the world to have been awarded 21 Michelin stars, and I believe he currently is 18. It's just incredible. He's incredible. Um, so that interview is now up if anyone wants to go listen to it. It was go, a real- go, go listen to that one. Go <laughs> listen to that one. <laughs> it was a real- it was a, it was Legend a real of honor. legends uh, right there. Yeah. yeah, so, so, but thank you. And so on this show, I asked him to ask you a question, and I mentioned um, some of the brands you worked with, and I, I mentioned Valrona. So I think this might have- um, uh, you know, inspired his question a bit, but he wanted to know if you had to combine cognac and chocolate, how would you approach that? And he said, if you don't have any ideas, he may have some. (laughs) Mm, Well, I, I I mean, I just want to defer to him uh, on this, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a lover of cognac. I'm a lover of chocolate. And I think, uh, they probably do go quite well together, uh, yeah, I, I have worked quite a bit with the Valrona selection and, and recently with um, one of their brands, Republica del Cacao, which is based in uh, in Quito, in Ecuador. And I was actually down there doing an exploration of the Amazon um, in their cacao production, as well as in the mountains in, of Turucucho, meeting with some of their dairy, their dairy providers. I, I think, you know, there's cognac has this. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but just as a passionate consumer has this fragrant boldness can also be, there's a sweetness to it, depending, depending on the brand, depending on, on, on the cognac. Um, it's quite a, uh, obviously refined and like incredible spirit. Um, I would want to pair with more of a dark, I, I really only, you know, eat dark chocolate. And so depending on the cognac, um, I'd probably want to do something with what I love is like a Republica del Cacao, you know, Peru 75 or up or something or something like that, because you're, I, I don't really want the sweetness. I want to taste more of the terroir of the chocolate 
in addition to you know really tasting the the bold notes and the fragrance of the and and like I said some of the sweetness of of the cognac I don't know if that's answering answering the question but I but again I want to I want to hear his <laughs> I want to hear his answer at uh, at some point <laughs> No that's amazing no they're very knowledgeable and I'm curious to see where he goes with this I mean he's he has these factories he does with chocolate and um and yes, he said he has ideas. So we'll see. We'll see. But um, the, cho- yeah, the chocolate cool. space is fascinating. I don't know if you've had anyone, Sherry, on your show who's a chocolatier or a producer, but like just the whole cultivation of, of and again, we're talking about fine aroma cacao, not bulk cacao, yeah. like fine aroma cacao, which is just a small portion of production, you know, in the world. But it, it really is fascinating. There's some amazing producers out there and it just... You know, every layer that you peel back, whether it's a chef or it's a producer, or it's a spirits founder or a winemaker, like you fall in love with these works of passion because that's what they are. You know, you fall in love with yeah. these products. And so chocolate is something that I've spent quite a bit of time highlighting a few people on the podcast, but actually being able to go out to the fields and 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 to the 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 Amazon and experience some of these indigenous communities that these great brands are, are working with. Um, it's fascinating. Well, I've listened to many of your shows, but I have not heard your, your chocolate focused episodes yet, but let's talk about your show because on the past you created, as we mentioned four years ago, what inspired you to want to do a podcast and, and how do you decide what guests to have on your show? Yeah, I think, I was working on a lot of branded content at the time and working in collaboration with brands like Perry Jouet Champagne or Valrona or Four Seasons um, and working with chefs or sommelier talent um, or mixologists was a key component of some of the content that I was doing. And oftentimes, as you know, with digital content, these interviews or these sort of these types of content are cut down into 30 seconds or or a minute and there was always like more interesting conversations with these talents after the production or before over lunch or or over dinner i so i just felt the need for for going a layer deeper of creating a platform or having a platform that was that lent itself to a little bit of more storytelling of diving in a little bit more to who these people are and why they do what they do. And like I said previously, like, you know, we, we had Sebastian Silvestri on who's CEO of, of Daniel Balud's company. And oh, yeah. he said, listen, he goes, I, I would have went into tech if, if, if I, if I wanted to like, just make money. These are works of passion, whether you're a restaurateur, you're a hotelier, you're a chef, you're a winemaker, all the people that we highlight and many of which who you highlight on your show, like why, I want to know, why do you get up every day and like, and sometimes kill yourself for this, this specific product or service. And it's also just a specific type of person that does that. And so I wanted to dive in deeper and, and understand more of why they do what they do. Because what I say is I get to have on, on my show some of the most interesting people that I've met in the world who, as you know, like whether they're a chef or they're all these, they're so multifaceted. They're so layered in, in their passions, in what, in what inspires them. I mean, it's like, I just had Alberto Landgraf on the podcast. Who's a fascinating chef um, who has a who has a two Michelin star restaurant in in Rio, yeah. and he's on the he's on the world's fifty yeah. best. Yeah, he's on yeah. the world's fifty best list. You know, Alberto is inspired by architecture, by design, by art. He's someone who spends his weekends going to museums. Like, yes, he studies his craft as a chef, but like he takes inspiration from so many other facets of life, and that's really me. And I think that's like curiosity. Um, and so I find these curious people and, um, that was, that was like the start of the show. I was like, I want to celebrate the diverse hospitality ecosystem that composes of food, beverage, and hospitality. And I didn't just want to do it domestically. I wanted to do it 
internationally. And so we have people on from all over the world and, and continuing to try to tap into new markets as well. Because as you know, there's a lot of stories to tell. There's so many, there's so many stories to tell, but I didn't want to be someone who just told stories of New York, LA, San Francisco. If you kind of understand the reference there, it's like, we get into this, like even food media sometimes, I think they've done a better job. And obviously with Michelin coming to Atlanta and opening new, new markets, world's 50 best next month in Vegas. Um, I think there's so many stories to tell. I, I'm so proud to be, you know, here in this country, but I'm I get inspired by people in Asia, in South America, in Europe. And so I, I want to tell those stories. And so that that's kind of really how it started. But as 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 you know, like it's like a lot of these podcasts became COVID podcasts in a in a lot of ways. And we had to pivot into doing not in person and 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 sort of over the screen like this. And then the conversations went from being beautiful conversations with Danielle Baloud of four, four decades in the industry to how do we survive? How do we survive this, this pandemic? And, and how do we talk about the CARES Act and the PPP? And so, you know, that was sort of a weird and interesting time for all of us and for the industry, but we just kept moving forward and my team kept moving forward and we're like, how do we be a resource? I'm sure a lot like you, like, how do we be a resource for these restaurants, for these chefs, for these hoteliers? Because we lost 90% of our clients, <laughs> you know, like all the, all the brands cut their spending, but I just kept it going. And it really like, it was, it was something that kept me sane during the pandemic. And I think now it's like, we made it through and and we've refined the show and kind of refined uh, our model and our formula and and are just like are challenging ourselves to be better storytellers is as well. Yeah, I think you and I have a lot in common and I think our passion for doing our shows is it's very is similar and the I love hearing people's stories and it's it was interesting we say the pandemic because um during that time I felt I felt because before the pandemic, I was doing my shows weekly and I was doing it live from a studio. And so it changed to, as you said, to going on screen. But I felt during that time, there was an added importance in a sense to my shows, mm -hmm. being that going through COVID and really helping people share their stories and what was going on um, and get that out there. I felt like, well, because you also, I felt a little helpless. Like, what can I do? Well, I'm like, well, I have a platform. Like, let me at least help share stories, which I felt, you know, I, I felt lucky that I could do. And, and I love on location shows now getting back into the field, I guess you'd Absolutely. say. And because like, as you mentioned, Alberto, like I have a, a, I, I went to dinner at Otec and met him, which was fantastic. And oh, it was amazing. It's a collaboration during the world's 50 best, the Latin American's 50 best. And at the awards, I'm, I saw him. I did like a quick interview with him on my podcast, which I do covering the awards, which was fun. But I love like the fact uh, I'm going to have to go back and listen to your show because like diving deeper into his, his whole his whole career and what inspires him. And there's something that drives him. And you, so I you love absolutely that I think you'll love that episode because, okay, he's one of he's one of the best chefs in the world. He he's been he's yeah. won the awards to say he's one of the best chefs in the world. But more, what's so interesting about that is is he he fell into being a chef. He that wasn't his plan. At all, and so when you yeah, hear the I've, story, I've heard that too. yeah, I'm like, right? I've you've like, heard that a few a few times now. It's yeah, amazing. I mean, it's just, but no, but like, if you, I love that element, and we talk about like that, that the way of being attention intentional in life, but also leaving room for luck. I, I like that. That yeah. was the that was that's what I love about learning about interesting people and successful people is it's not always like intentional. It's not always like Oh, oh, this is what I want to do. And I set a plan. And in five years, I did this. We have to leave room in life for luck. And 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 that's what happened. Yeah. I love that. So who do you have coming up on your show that you're excited about besides everyone? <laughs> oh, I, there's a lot. There's a lot of people that that I'm excited about. I mean, you asked me like how I decide 
it, honestly, it's it, it's just I, I I get a lot. I'm sure similar to you. There's a lot of PR incoming, and then yeah. there's just a lot of like friends of friends, and then there's a lot of guests that recommend uh, of other other guests, and so for a small team, you know, there's only four of us, like it's, it's a lot to kind of manage because we, I also have a, like another business, but as you know, this is like, it, it can be a full, it's like a full-time thing, you know, do doing all of this. But again, it's a work of passion and I, and I absolutely love it. Um, I'd say it's a hybrid between, you know, really reviewing some of the incoming pitches and then just being a little bit more timely I think as well and kind of seeing who's doing what and who's announcing what, but also just really having on people that I really love and respect and, and that I admire. And there's so many of those people. And you know, just Alberto was one that we talked about in 2021 of doing something and it never happened. But I, but I was actually like happy that we waited until a couple, a couple months ago, because there was actually more to talk about and to talk about how he launched, you know, launched that restaurant in, in the UK and now he's not doing that anymore. And so like, you know, talking a little bit about that, talking a little bit about that story and also where he wants to go as a chef now that he's accomplished so much. And so I think also just like being timely and who's launching this book or who has this exciting launch, or there's these, you know, there's a hotelier that I have coming on who is, has four hotel, you know, launches this in the next eight months. And so that's kind of exciting, you know, also to, to highlight some of, some of those stories, but it's also Sherry, like a vibe too. Like I try to, I always get on the phone beforehand. I always meet with them or we always talk over zoom and, um, you know, not everybody vibes and that's okay. And so sometimes I'm like, Hey, I, I, I want my show to be fun, educational, but also like entertaining for the listener as well. Like, you know, I, if, especially people who are just listening on audio, it has to have movement. It has to have momentum. And so you lose people sometimes. And so I want to keep that momentum by getting the right takeaways from the guest, but also like it to be fun and interesting and like for, for a bit of the personality of the guest to come out. Because I yeah. think ultimately in branding and in storytelling, like, like that's wh- how I get attracted to brands or to people is like, wow, like I love that brand, but after meeting the CEO and how cool and interesting and everything, like I'm really in love with that brand. So I love bringing out, you know, kind of people's personalities. Yeah, no, I get it all. And and I I mean, just listening to you talk, it's in your voice, your your passion comes out. And, and yes, that's, I think I, I keep going with my show because there's so many people I still want to have on. I can't. It's like endless, right? It's endless, absolutely. <laughs> um, which, which I guess is, I say it's a good problem, or I don't have enough shows. It's a good problem. Well, quality but, problems, as yeah, we say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so before we take a break, tell tell us a little more about your other business, and and because because you wear a few hats, and the podcast is is one of one of the things you're doing, but it isn't even like primarily your main focus, or maybe it's becoming that, but yeah, what no, it's, it, it's, it, it's, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the energy and the, I put a lot of energy and a lot of passion and hopefully, yeah. you know, the listeners experience that into the podcast, but no, I, so I, I run a, I run sort of a boutique creative production company called Studio Ornelas. And as you said, it's sort of like, again, this multidisciplinary group of we're business builders and, 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 how I show that is I'm not only telling you, like, I don't just want to be a company that tells you what to do with your brand. I want to show you that I've also built a brand because I, I, I look at that when I partner with people and I'm like, well, what have, what have you done? You know? And so, so I think, I think in showing that Studio Ornelas has created a brand that, you know, as small as it may be, um, and, you know, it has, it has some influence and, and people want to be on the show and people um, are excited about the platform. And so we get to work with amazing brands all the time and really help them build community. So again, it's like everything works hand in hand. Like, like, and how do you build community? Well, you do that through storytelling. You do that through 
unique and interesting and educational content. You do that through experiences and also working with talent. And so our focus is really on creative production, events, and talent. Um, and so we merge those whole world, worlds together. And so we've been fortunate enough, like I said, to work with amazing brands, um, Perfect Day and Perrier Jouet and, and Ocho Tequila, Faena and SBE, and really help them tell better stories, but also go back to what I said earlier, create community. Because again, like I remember when I had Jillian Dara, um, well, she did, she did a Substack article on me and then I had her on the podcast this year, but she had asked me like, what's the common thread between every single one of your guests? And again, remember all these guests like yours, some of them are chefs, some of them are hoteliers, some of them are winemakers or, or CEOs. It's all community building. They're all trying to create community around their particular product or service, but doing it in a different way. Some of them are hosting amazing tastings and getting, you know, kind of liquid to lips experiences. Some of them are really layering into using micro influencers like chefs and like, like mixologists. Some of them are creating amazing, you know, brand homes and bringing people in for these once in a lifetime memorable experiences. And so we want to help brands create those moments, which in a lot of ways allows individuals like yourself to sell more stories in all the time. And so a lot of the work that we've done has given the PR teams the ability to, to talk about more things, to say, hey, there's this amazing partnership with World's 50 Best to talk about. There's this amazing chef talent or this advisory committee that we put together for this, this brand of chefs that can sell in more sell in more stories and create more content opportunities and so that's what drives me that's what gets me excited and i i just i love working with the big brands the middle sized brands but like i also love being able to really create a positive impact on smaller smaller you know small to to, to medium sized well funded companies because as you know a big article that you get for a smaller client is super meaningful. A, a partnership with a chef, with a smaller brand is super meaningful. Whereas in contrast, some of the work that I did with Perry Jouet, I'm proud of, but it's a global brand. Like, like how much lift with that piece of content or that partnership or that event? Yes, there was some, but it's so much more impactful with some of these small to medium sized brands. And I get excited about that as well. The budgets aren't, aren't always there sometimes, <laughs> you know, that, that's the bigger brands, but you know, we, 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 fi we figure that out. And I think, you know, great work finds the right, you know, the right opportunities. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. How big is your team? How many people do you have? What's your we? <laughs> well, on, on the on the podcast, we have four people on the podcast, and then two of those people work at Studio Ornelas with me. And so there's a core team of probably four to five. And then we have photographers and videographers and individuals that are not full time, but that are kind of trusted collaborators that we've been working with for quite some time. Um, it's like there's a project in South Africa that I'm working on in Stellenbosch. I think I, maybe I mentioned it to you when we had gotten together in the wine region. And I'm bringing one of my photographers from here, but there's a videographer that I worked with several years ago who is living in the UK, but is going to be in South Africa during that time. And so I'm working with them on that specific project. But, you know, we have this kind of rapport already and we've worked together and there's yeah. sort of a mutual respect. Cool. Well, if you need to outsource to a PR person or something, send, send me to Africa. I, I think, I, I think, I, I think there's, <laughs> I think there's definitely lots of ways for, for us to connect and collaborate. I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm game. <laughs> no, but, and, and in all seriousness, it would be awesome to figure out ways to work together on, Absolutely. on you know, things you're, we're, we're, you're we're going on. to. Yeah, it would be 100%. amazing. You do such a great job with the brands you work with, with your podcast, with everything you do. I've said this, like your passion comes out. You could tell like you, you figured out the right fit for you. And because I think it shows, it shows that it's, it's not just a job, you know, and, and I think no, that it's, 
It's it's not. Yeah. And that's also goes for the people that work with me and collaborate with me. I want them to be deeply passionate about the work that we're doing. And when I work with a brand, I really mean it. I say, the reason I can give you the advice and guidance that I can give you is because I'm the consumer. I yeah. know I I know what <laughs> I want as the consumer. And so when I when I I'm 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 wearing two hats. I'm being sort of the creative uh, you know, producer and executive, but I'm also a deeply passionate consumer. And so wearing both those hats, I think you can be quite dangerous in really helping some of these brands because you're looking from both lenses. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Okay. On that note, let's take a little break and we'll come back. We'll play my speed realm. We'll talk a little industry news, my solo dining experience and the final question. So stay with us. This is all in the industry on Heritage Radio Network. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Wisconsin, the state of cheese, makes half of the nation's specialty cheese and wins more awards than any other state or country. Our heritage and traditions, master cheesemaker program, and the American propensity for innovation all put Wisconsin on the cutting wedge of cheesemaking. With over 600 varieties of cheese to choose from and 5,500 national and international awards and counting, get ready to turn your refrigerator into a trophy case. Enjoying a Wisconsin cheese is basically like winning a gold medal in culinary achievement. Set your mind at cheese. When you bite into a wedge of Wisconsin Wonderful, you know it is made with the ultimate skill and passion possible. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer. My guest today is Gabriel Arnelis, strategist, producer, and founder of Studio Arnelis, which is a global multidisciplinary group of business builders who are deeply invested in the worlds of food, hospitality, travel, and culture. And he's the host and producer of On the Past podcast, which is is now celebrating its fourth anniversary, which is amazing. Um, so it's time for my speed round. So what this is, is I'm going to name a couple things and you get to pick your preference, such as chocolate or vanilla. Mm -hmm. You ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, ready. Okay. Ready okay, for here. it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Born ready. <laughs> Born ready. Eat in at home or eat out at a restaurant? Depends on the night. You just said you were born ready. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's the true depends answer. The it depends night. on the night. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Depends on the night. Tonight, what are you feeling? Tonight, As I'll be night. eating out. Out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tonight. How about indoor dining or alfresco dining? Well, it depends on where you're at in the world, but alfresco, di alfresco dining. If the weather's nice, I'll always enjoy a bit of sun and a breeze. Yes. I hear you. Wine, beer, Mocktail, cocktail, or champagne? Ooh, depends on the mood, depends on the meal. But uh, if, if you were to put a gun to my head and, and ask me, uh, I'd probably say either a crisp glass of wine in, in, that's dry in the afternoon or a really refreshing cocktail. Okay. How about tasting menu or a la carte? <laughs> I, I'm laughing because recently I've gone to a few um, tasty places that do tasting menu but offer a la carte, and we ordered a la carte. But because we knew the chef, they sent out every they sent out everything else as and as well. So we we basically did the tasting menu. But um, I love to put to put my life in the chef's hands. Yeah. It's like tasting menu a la carte or the whole menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or the whole menu, which which actually like that was too much. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it's too much. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's um, it's it's nice to be treated, but it, and, and and to get to try so many things. But I Absolutely. also know it can be a bit overwhelming. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another another really good problem to have. Quality not problems even, again. Yeah, not even a problem. Um, okay, small plates or large plates. Small plates. Communal table or chef's counter? 
Mm, I, I I love a chef's counter, but I would say communal table. I, I love uh, interacting with with people, and I love learning from people. So nice. How about tipping or all inclusive charge? Are you asking what my preference is on on that? You I mean, can I interpret I, this however you want. It's it's a bit of this that could be its own show. I like to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that could be. Um, I I love when there's a, a healthy tip kind of already added. It sort of is easier on uh, you know on on us as as consumers. Um, so yeah, I kind of love when it's when it, it it's it's kind of taken care of already. And sometimes you know depending on the relationship in the meal, uh, you know I may put it on my card, but then leave a leave a little extra for for the staff. Okay, that's nice too. A few more. Staying in hotels or Airbnbs? Mm, I, I love hotels. I love hotels. Um, I, I'd probably lean on that. I remember talking to Omar Lovani about that, how he's like, he's like, I just love staying in hotels. I love kind of the experience that it provides, especially some of the hotels that we get to to stay at. But there is something to say about being a part of a community a little bit more and actually having a bit of that local um, local experience by maybe staying in a Airbnb that is more of a, a neighborhood vibe where you get, you go to the grocery store, you maybe get some groceries as well. For me, I'm, you know, I'm a Libra Sherry. So like, it depends on the mood. It depends on the moment. It depends on the <laughs> trip. So, I mean, I'd probably say hotels, but I do okay. love an Airbnb experience. There's there's, I'm not going to hold you down to any of this, <laughs> just so you know. You can change your mind at any moment. I and probably yes. will. I probably yeah. will. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, someone just just yesterday, I was talking to someone about hotels, and I was telling them how I like staying in hotels. Like I like, I, yeah. I don't know, I like yeah. the experience of it. Absolutely. Um, okay, um, hosting a podcast or being interviewed on a podcast. Mm. I enjoy both. To be to be honest with yeah. you, but I I do I do really get a lot of pleasure out of hosting, um, because it's sort of we're kind of the conversation is in our hands in a lot of ways as the host, and we're sort of guiding it, and yeah. then taking certain cues from the guests, and I kind of love that delicate balance of kind of that ebb and flow of a conversation, and letting them kind of be who they are, but then sort of guiding them, you know, through through the conversation. Yeah, very cool. Okay, my last two. I have cheese plate or dessert. I, I'm a sweets guy, so yeah, I'm probably gonna go dessert okay. most of the time. And last one, I have Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Los Angeles, which doesn't really make sense, but that's what I do. <laughs> uh, like, where would I want to spend the afternoon? Or yeah, where would you like to spend the afternoon? Well, today I'm in Los Angeles. So I'm spending the day in Los Angeles, but I do like I just feel like sometimes my heartbeat is is back in is back in New York and my sister lives in Williamsburg and my family's from Greenpoint originally and so, you know, love to I'm going to answer it in the way that like I'll, I might start my day in Brooklyn, but I might end up in Manhattan. I might end end up in Manhattan later later in the day. Okay, it's doable. <laughs> yeah, it's very doable. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's the game. Thank you. you yeah, you, you thank got, you. You got through it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank it's you for fine. putting up it's with my sort of answering, non-answering questions. No, it's interesting because so many, I mean, a lot of people, there's the, you want to say both. And obviously it's situational in some of these. Yeah, of course. Some people, some people can fly through it and they're 100%. just like. 100%. No, 100%. You're like, I know what I like. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah, like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So for industry news, it was it was interesting because I went I went on Eater LA because I figured, yeah. oh, you're in Los Angeles. Let me like, let me see what's happening out there. And there was a link to an article on Eater San Francisco entitled, A New Law That Goes Into Effect July 1st Could Upend California's Restaurant Industry. California's ban on so-called junk fees goes into effect in less than 60 days, but it's not clear how the law will be enforced at restaurants and bars. And this was by Lauren Saria. So when it's big news, 
you know, uh, eaters, they link to other articles that are significant. So this made sense that this is a big thing happening or being talked about in California. I don't know how familiar you are with it. Um, I I'm, not, like I'm not super, I'm not super familiar. No. Reading through the article. So basically it's saying on July 1st, there's, there's a thing called junk fees, which I've noticed when I've traveled to California that it's charges on the bill that are covering other expenses for the restaurant. I'm I'm definitely familiar with that. I did not know the term junk fee. That was the like, first time I've I've heard that. It's sort of an interesting term for that. I didn't know either, but that's what they're calling it. And it says this is a law that would prohibit restaurants from tacking on any charges besides taxes to diners bills. The ban on surcharges would mark a watershed moment for the state's restaurant industry, which has in recent years relied on mandatory service charges to supplement optional tips and boost staff wages. Under yeah. the Attorney General's interpretation of new legislations, however, all, all charges by tax would be illegal. So, yeah, it's, it's my first time that I heard it as junk, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, an interesting term to be used. But yeah. Um, I then saw David Nafeld, who's a chef in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. He has Cafico. He's been on my podcast. Um, he's awesome. His restaurant's awesome. Um, he then, I saw a, like an op-ed sort of piece he put out on San Francisco Standard talking about, and the title, he just says, New Junk Fee Law is a Slap in the Face to San Francisco Restaurant Owners. Mm -hmm. um, so he's he was talking all about how this is like, would be very, very hurtful for restaurants and that they, I mean, summarizing it, but like they, they don't really get it in the sense, like what it takes to run a restaurant and why they have these sure. fees. Sure. Um, so I, I think both of these articles are worth reading. And yeah, I'm yeah, definitely absolutely. not an expert on any of this. I just thought I should bring it up as like, this is something big in the restaurant industry that's happening. No, in for sure. Government. For sure. I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, I mean, gr granted, I, I'm grateful that I know junk fee. I think it should be rebranded re um, <laughs> potentially. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Give me a call. Um, but, but yeah, I, Listen, there's so many conversations we've had, whether it was with Jamila Robinson or just last week with Kat O'Dell, talking about uh, how challenging it is to to run a restaurant. Obviously, as we all know, the small, limited margins um, and how staffing all over the country uh, is is really challenged, you know, right now. But especially in states like California and uh, and and New York, and so. I think, yeah, this is a real challenge for for restaurants. I mean, I see these fees all the time, um, whether it's called a health fee or it's a appreciation fee or it's a that's yeah. why the word junk kind of threw me off. I wasn't really sure where where that article was going was going with that. But I, I think and this is something I talked to a lot of people about, like, I think general consumers need to become more educated on the restaurant business and and I think the restaurant business and industry needs to continue to do a good job but a better job in telling the stories and educating consumers why prices have gone up why why things are so expensive because also their cost of goods has gone up as well and so I know we we all want to eat out as much as possible and and people want to continue to support restaurants but you 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 have to understand what these restaurants are going through before you can just sit there and 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 plainly complain about pricing and everything. Um, these restaurants, these coffee shops, these places these are these are places of community. These are places that really build a neighborhood. We need like we need these places. Um, and so you know, I'm really always a proponent and in favor of of the restaurants. Granted. As a as a consumer, sometimes I go to a restaurant and go, "Oh my gosh, that was <laughs> that was really expensive that night." But I also have a deep appreciation and understanding of of what it took for that chef and that team to create the experience and for the food to get onto the plate and for the hospitality. And so, you know, I may I may sort of cringe a little bit, but go listen, like that's. That's why I continue to work and do the work that I do so I can so I can afford to continue to support 
these these places. And so um, that's this that's a challenge. I'm going to now now that you brought that up, I think everybody should go and really, especially in the state of California, understand more deeply what this how this is going to have an effect on 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 the restaurants and these great places that we call call home you know in 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 a, in a lot of places whether it's a bar it's a restaurant it's a you know it's a coffee shop like these are places that we all congregate and meet and and celebrate and um yeah i think we need to continue to support these places yeah i agree with everything you said absolutely and i think it i mean having now worked in this industry a long time and working primarily do PR for restaurants and I know how hard it is. And, you know, restaurants are in the, they're in the hospitality industry. Like they're they're trying to provide beautiful experiences for people, wonderful food, service, ambiance, like people who get into, I think, hospitality really want it. They want to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think, but I think when it comes to, I mean, even from my book, um, Chef Wise, that ca- recently came out on Chef Advice, asked chefs about the business side of restaurants and profit mm-hmm. and loss and like how the margins are so tight. And and I think to the most consumers or general public maybe don't realize how tight that is and, mm-hmm. and that it, but it is a business and you've got to make ends meet. And so um, I think it's, I think it's challenging. I'm so pro restaurants and so like a cheerleader for the industry and support. I hear you though. Also on the, sometimes I'm like, well, that was an expensive evening or, you know, but it's like where, you know, I want to be supportive and I get that you got to charge what you have to charge. But um, yeah, these are interesting reads. I mean, David's article, he makes, you know, he talks about, you know, why they have the different, surcharges they've had um and and really just you know explains why he he feels would would really hurt restaurants if they Mm -hmm. if Mm -hmm. they move forward with this so um i think people yeah take a look um you could google it they're they're available you know um online and there's probably more stuff too that yeah yeah i want to continue to follow this this story um because I i do think it's very it's very interesting yeah. Um, okay. So I thought I'd bring that up. And now it's time for my solo dining experience. So I was just away in Copenhagen. So um, I picked a restaurant from my experience there. So here's the rundown. The restaurant this week is based. The location, let's see how I pronounce this, Gold Bears God at 2200 Copenhagen, Denmark. That is the address. Based is an organic restaurant that's mad about raw milk cheeses, artisanal butchery, and award-winning pizza. The chef and owner is Christian F. Puglisi, who's in my Chef List book. He was also, I, when I was in Copenhagen last time, I did an interview with him at Mirabelle, which is a restaurant next door to Based. It's now called Mirabelle Spiceria, and that episode is 377 if anyone wants to check it out. He's an amazing, amazing chef. He used to have uh, claimed restaurants Relay and Manfred's all in, in Copenhagen, also fa- just fantastic places. So why did I go? Well, I arrived in Copenhagen. It was Sunday, and I was I didn't have a plan that night. And I'd been there maybe five or six years ago, but I was like, oh, I'm going to see if they're open Sunday night. And I looked it up and they were open. I was excited. So I'm like, this is where I'm going. So my experience, I got over there after 930. I saw they close at 10. So I was just like, I walked in, no reservation. I'm like, table for one? <laughs> and they were like, yes, we'd love to have you. So the place is very cozy. I mean, it's a pretty large restaurant, but the design of it just makes you feel like you're almost in someone's home. Um, and it's centered around their their wood-fired pizza. And um, Christian wasn't there that night. I sent him a note that I was there, let him know I was in town. But his team took really wonderful care of me, and I had a really great time. So what did I get? So I've been over ordering lately or all the time. I don't know. I can't help myself. Um, So I had the based hand stretched mozzarella, which is like you have to get the mozzarella. They make it from scratch. It's like unbelievable. Um, I had a side bread basket. I had a small plate of their charcuterie, which they make as well. Um, I got a little green salad that had a 
herb emulsion and pistachio crumble. And then I had a classic pizza, which had tomato sauce, garlic, oregano, and the base stracciatella. And then I just went all out as a sweets person and I got dessert too. I got buckwheat cake with reduced whey based gelato and hazelnuts. And you get where I'm going with this. Um, so my take, I wrote this on Instagram. I said, it's as good as it gets. I mean, like, you, like when someone's making house made mozzarella, order it. And if you're in Copenhagen, go to this restaurant. It's unbelievable. The charcuterie. Be rude not to. It would, I couldn't have said that better. Yes, be it would rude be rude not, not to. to. Don't be rude to the to the chef and the team. <laughs> Seriously. And the pizza, it's sort of an, it's like an individual size. It's a little bigger than that. But um, it was, it was one of the best pizzas I can remember having like recently or maybe even ever. Like it's that good. So my, it was, it was exceptional. I was very happy with the meals. The dessert was great. It was just really, it was like perfect I don't want to use the word simple, but it's sort of like he he showcases beautiful ingredients and there's a simplicity of it, but it's all done so well. And it's just, it was just a perfect casual meal on a Sunday night in Copenhagen. So that was my take. The ambiance, as I said, it's casual, it's cozy, um, and it's low lit, has uh, lots of windows facing, I guess it's kind of like a little alleyway of a street. And I believe in summertime when it's warmer, they have tables outside. So it kind of creates like, it's like a little vibey, it's got a vibe in this part of Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. Like it's a little, there's a few restaurants back to back. And so it has good energy. Um, I'd say it's perfect for dining with friends. Interesting tidbit. So if you're on Instagram, I suggest you follow Christian F. Puglisi. His his Instagram is at C-H-R-I-F-R-A-P-U-G. He started several months ago doing these videos um, and they're really well produced and they're fun and he shows you how he makes different things, but I think he's doing a really great job. So check that out. Um, he also has an, a book that came out in 2014 called Relay, A Book of Ideas, which um, I think is is worth getting and looking into. He has his own sort of um, style of doing doing the book, the way he designed the different chapters. And as I mentioned, he's in my book, Chef Wise, uh, which came out last year, and I'm proud to have him as a contributor. Okay, so personal fun fact, I'm going to run through real fast here, places I ate. <laughs> um, so I went to Noma. I went to their ocean season, uh, which was happening now. I'd been in previous seasons and I really want to check out ocean and the seafood and it was wonderful. This is Renee Rizepi's restaurant. I also got a tour of Noma Projects facility while I was there. So thank you, Jenny. And I ran into a chef wise chef, Ed Werner, who was of Pasteur in Auckland, New Zealand. And he um, is working right now at Noma. So that was a highlight for me to get to meet him. Um, I went back to Christian Bauman's Cohen restaurant and and he's also in my book. And I did several interviews while I was there. I did an interview with Christian Bauman. I did an interview with Bo Beck at Bobe, which I'd been to. And I know Bo, he's a fabulous lunch there. I also did an interview with Rossman Monk of Alchemist, which was an amazing experience. And I did an interview with Jonathan Tam of Yatak, which I, I dined at the last time I was in Copenhagen. And they're all outstanding chefs. And I had amazing experiences at all of them. So I look forward to sharing those with you. I also went and saw Rosio Sanchez at a restaurant, Sanchez, and Bo Klugstein at Aluka, a fabulous seafood restaurant, and Sanchez is a fabulous Mexican restaurant. Um, those were great. I went to Fisk Bar. I went to Shoneman's Palagate in Montegard, and I had s'mores board. I tried the burger, gasoline grill. I went to bar for schnitzel. I don't know. How did I do all this? I went to Juno Bakery, Lille, Hart Bakery, and some coffee shops like Prologue and La Cambra, which is now in New York. It was cool to see the original there. So I had a hot dog. I'm like, okay, I'm crazy when I travel. Um, but the food in Copenhagen is outstanding. And I obviously tried to hit as many places, a new place I hadn't been to. So um, if you haven't been to Copenhagen, I highly suggest it. And next time I go, I want to go in the summertime in um, July or August because I've always been there when it's cold. 
<laughs> so to wrap this up, the cost of my meal was 470 krone. That's about $67. Would I go back? Yes. And their website is based dot dk instagram at base cph and that's b-a-e-s-t okay there you go um have you been there gabriel <laughs> I, I didn't know if i'm supposed to speak right now i wasn't i wasn't, I wasn't sure so, so i i kind of run through it but yeah you could have chimed in i had to did. chime in when when you were saying uh about about the desserts but i didn't want to be rude and um you wouldn't and be rude in. i feel rude that i went on so long but no 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 i mean you <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm starving right now. I've eaten nothing. But now that I've heard about all those meals, yes, I've been to Copenhagen a few times. In fact, I was there in the last time I was there, summertime was in July of 2022. It was fantastic. You have to go in the summertime. I ate at some of the places that that you mentioned. I was at Prologue and probably every morning and a few a few other places, but. I kind of what brought me there was obviously not just the culinary, but a, a very good friend of mine is the head of marketing for Lego, which is obviously based in 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 Denmark. But she lives in Copenhagen because the corporate office is outside of is outside of Copenhagen. Um, she had her wedding, which was actually in Vogue um, for Vogue uh, Denmark. But she's uh, as, as I would expect. Yeah, yeah, as 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 one does, but it was a traditional Nigerian uh, wedding as well. She comes from a Nigerian family. He's he's American, but they live in Copenhagen, and so it was amazing. All the worlds colliding from like, you know, Denmark, the U.S., Nigeria, other parts of Europe, Um, and so there was some fun food adventures with some of the uh, some of the, you know, some of the people that were at the wedding as well. But that made my my Copenhagen trip that much more special because I love going and doing what you did um, and, and and seeing all the chefs and experiencing the restaurants, but going for like a cultural moment like that, which now like a lot of the city has heard about, um, you know, is as well, which was like really, really fun. And I was the MC yeah. for the wedding. Oh, so, amazing. Yeah. That's really special. Yeah. And I have to say my flight for some reason was canceled and I was put on a flight the next day. So I got an extra day <laughs> and I used my extra day to go to Tivoli Gardens, which I, because I run around to restaurants usually yeah. all day, um, I finally went and I had went on some rides and I, I had a hot well, dog fun. there. And that's actually where I tried the burger, the um, gasoline grill burger, which people talk about. It was really good. But I feel like they could do weddings there. It's kind of, it's a sure. very magical little yeah. place in the middle of Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah, have people haven't been, I mean, I, the first time I was there, I walked by it probably 25 different times, but didn't, didn't want to go in. And the second time I was there, I actually went and, and experienced it for a little bit, but yeah, it's worth, it's worth checking out. I mean, yes, exactly. I was staying like right nearby and I'm like, I have to go in, I have to go in. And then yeah. I ended up staying much longer than I even thought. Cause I was, I liked it. It was fun. How fun. <laughs> yeah, go, okay. go in the summer, go in the summertime as well. So you can experience that. That's yes. I would like to see and jump in the water, which, um, I mean, yeah, I was still wearing a puffy jacket most of this trip. <laughs> well, you can always the cold plunging is quite uh, popular right now, so you can always do yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, okay, so it's time for the final question. So I'm excited. My next guest is Tim Brooke Webb. He's the managing director of Fifty Tim. Best. <laughs> you know Tim? <laughs> yeah. He's a great well, guy. he's so I was in Seoul for. Asia's 50 best. And I knew mm -hmm. of him, but I actually hadn't met him and we met in person. And so um, he's going to be coming on the show. His overall responsibility for 50 best since 2009. And we're going to talk all about the different launches that have happened since he's been there, including Asia's 50 best restaurants and Latin America's 50 best restaurants. And as you mentioned earlier, and I've mentioned on the show, coming up June 5th is the world's 50 best restaurants and it's taking place in Las Vegas this year and I'm planning to be there. So I'm excited to chat with him. So what would you like to ask Tim? Oh my gosh. What would I like to, what don't I want to ask Tim? It's funny. I just talked to him yesterday and uh, I was like, we hadn't talked in a little while and I was like, 
Tim, the man, the myth, the legend. And he goes, do you always introduce yourself like that when you, when, when you, when, when you get on the phone? I said, I'm talking about you. But uh, it, was, it was just funny. That's we funny. always have funny, funny banter. But so Tim, as I, as I know and follow him frequently on, he, he's an automotive guy. OK, he loves he loves uh, the automotive space and and, uh, you know, I think sports cars and stuff like that. So what what I would be interested to is to merge the world of culinary and his passion for automotive and say, if there's a trip. Almost like almost like the Michelin guide, you know, in a way, is there is there a specific route that he really wants to do and hit up a few few restaurants um and what car would he be driving Ooh. and who and who would he bring along with him so i i just i think it merges the world of culinary and you know i don't know maybe it's somewhere through a part of italy maybe it's somewhere through in the uk maybe it's somewhere in the south of france maybe it's in asia who knows tim is a man about town he's traveled the world um you know both personally and professionally so would love to know What's the route? What's the car he's driving? Why is he driving that car? And who's who's he bringing along with him? All right. Well, now I kind of want him. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could segue that in. Can I there go, you go with him? Um, awesome. That's a great question, and it's uh, it's a first for this show. Um, but that Cherry, we got to mix it up a little bit. You know, we got to mix things up. <laughs> but it's so specific to him, which is why it's a first. You know, it's great in that I figured you knew him, but I didn't know you knew him as well. But um, yeah, that's great. Are you going to be at Fifty Best in Vegas? I will. I will. I will. I'll see you. I'll, I'll see you there. It's going to be fun. It is going to be fun. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to chat with him. And so tell, tell him I you. tell him I said hello. I will. Um, I wish we we could go on and on and talk more. Um, we I, we could I, talk more. I know <laughs> we, um, we could, but the listeners don't don't want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, thank you so much for joining me, and congratulations no, thank you for having me. Uh, the, the, this is really, um, it's been an honor to have you on my show and get to know you and, and congratulations on everything you've achieved. I mean, you, you got your way in somehow, or you broke into the industry, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. but you definitely made an impact and have like created a very unique company businesses, you know, you're the way you're doing things. I feel like you're doing things your way or a different way than most. That's, that's, the, that's yeah. the only way I know how to, how to do things. And, yeah. and I, I'm hoping to be in this, just like you, Sherry, like in this industry for a long time. So I'm not a short game person, you know, I'm a relationship person. And so I, I'm excited to connect with people like you and, and other people and, you know, uh, find ways to collaborate and work together and learn and learn from one another because Again, I, I'm I'm not in this for the next couple of years. Like I plan on for decades, and hopefully seeing, you know, riding the wave too, and and being a part of some of the innovation, being a part of the change, being a part of you know the positivity that this industry brings to to all of our lives. Um, so I'm excited about that, and you know, congratulations to you on all you do, and. And in this show, for all the years it, it's been on, as I said in the beginning, it's no small feat, um, but it's it's been so fun to chat with you. Thank you, I appreciate it, and um, yeah, to to podcasting. <laughs> love it, love it. Thank you. My guest today has been Gabriel Arnelis, strategist, producer, and founder of Studio Arnelis, and he's the host and producer of On the Past podcast. So, how can my guests find you? So it's www.studioornelas.com, then www.onthepasspodcast.com. And then our Instagram is uh, at it's on the pass. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's about it. I, mean, I also have www.gabrielornelas.com, but I think with Studio Ornelas and On the Pass, people can kind of get to, uh, to everything else. They can so, find so, you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And your podcast, like mine, I is it's like available on all platforms. Every everywhere, you know. I'm sure there's new platforms that are going to be <laughs> popping up here here pretty soon. Um, you know, I just got an email that said like your 
you're a top podcast on good good pod and i'm like what's good pod i, yeah. I don't I, I don't even know what that is so uh it's kind it's of interesting but yeah i mean most people listen on spotify apple amazon music um so yeah we're available for people to check it out hopefully they enjoy Awesome. And same for me. My podcast is available all those places. And you can follow me at Sherry Bayer at Bayer PR and at All Industry. My Facebook page is All in the Industry. And my websites are BayerPublicRelations.com, SherryBayer.com, and All in the Industry.com. And the shows are archived at Heritage Radio Network.org. Check out my new book, Chef Wise Life Lessons from Leading Chefs Around the World by Fiden. It's available wherever books are sold. And it's also cool when I was in Copenhagen, went by a bookstore and my book's there. And that's like the coolest, most surreal thing. So thank you, bookstores around the world, for carrying it. Um, that's thanks to my great. engineer today, Armin. Thanks again to Gabriel. And thanks to his awesome publicist, Autumn Lewis. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer. I will be back with a new show next week. I hope you'll tune in then. And thank you, as always, for being part of All in the Industry. Bye. All in the Industry is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.